I, I mean, pay increases, I understand. But, you know, 15, 20 years, what does this city need to do to sure. keep police officers? Right. So there's, there's technology that we can employ to make us a little bit more efficient. Um, I could bore you for the next 10 minutes and talk a little bit about predictive policing and making sure we're a little bit uh, smarter about putting cops on dots, using them in the right areas in the right time and things like that. We're, uh, we're pretty tight and pretty lean and mean right now. Um, um, I think that, and I'll just be honest with you, I'm not, especially since that camera's on, I'm not trying to get fired by my mayor, but I think um, you, ought to, uh, you ought to pay a police officer what the market demands. And I think that uh, if there are other departments in the area, i.e. Aurora and Denver, when you back out the cost of living, and it's still thousands and thousands of dollars a month, that means a lot to a 25-year-old kid who wants to be a cop. He, he or she's going to not, not work here. And I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that in people leaving and going to other police departments and uh, getting paid a little bit more. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's a big deal. We're employing a lot of different strategies. I'm, I'm now hiring community service officers. They're not sworn uh, people in uniform. They don't make arrests and things like that. But they can handle the lower end uh, crimes and they can do it. Um, uh, they make about a third to a half of, of what a police officer makes. It's part time, so I don't have a legacy cost of paying their uh, pensions and all that when they retire. Um, but it's not a police officer, but it still meets the needs of uh, responsiveness to the community and customer service. So there's strategies that we're doing. Um, but I think that one of the main driving forces right now is, um, um, is um, um, the, the amount of money we're paying them. And you know, we have an interesting dynamic at the sheriff's office. And uh, starting in 2013 through 13 and 14, we hired 195 people following the passing of the public safety tax. That was a huge increase. It was a, it was a huge help to the, to the sheriff's office and to the county. We hired 195 people. We brought them in. We put them through a 22-week uh, police academy, police academy, a post-certified training and then we put them in the jail. And again, it's a 1,700 person inmate jail, and we take all of our new employees, we train them to be police officers, and then we put them in a jail. And out of those 195 people, we lost roughly 30% in the first two years. 30%. The training, like Pete says, it takes a year, it costs you about $65,000 to get them out of training, when you lose 30% of almost 200 people, the cost was phenomenal. And so we said, we've got to do this differently. We've got to figure this out because before 2015, the salary, the starting salary of a deputy sheriff was about $8,000 a year less than CSPD. And it followed that trend all the way up through the deputy one or P CSP one, patrolman one. And we, we, we watched that and said, we've got to do something about that. And the county did a study using the top 10 counties in the state. Mountain States Employment Council did a study and said, here is the minimum salary range of deputy sheriffs across Colorado. And here is the median and here is the maximum. And last year they gave us an addition to our budget to move our entry level to that minimum salary level, to the minimum salary level. And what it did is it put us higher than CSPD. The problem is, is it now says, now we've got competing interests. You might make more money working at the sheriff's office, but you're going to work the first two to three years in a jail. So the, the pool that we, are, uh, that we are looking at of personnel are completely different. We're fishing from a small pond, though. We exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and that's just it. It's, it's difficult fishing, isn't it? Y'all may or may not be aware of every single incentive that is offered by departments around the country. The things that did work in Macon, Georgia were, and still are, officers can take home the cars. And this is at lunch and overnight at their homes. Another thing is officers that are in precincts, patrol policemen, they are given a free house in that precinct. Their family can live there, they can live there. That way they're interacting with all their neighbors and because you see that police car there all the time, it's providing more of a presence in people's consciousness 
of police officers in my precinct. It's a, great, it's a great idea. The sheriff's office had a take home policy. Everybody in the law enforcement bureau, 200 officers, uh, just shy of 200 officers, had a take home car a year ago. And while it sounds like a great plan, they can only use that car to drive back and forth to work. We don't allow them to take a more school <coughs> car to the grocery store to take their kids to daycare. And the problem is, not everybody likes it. Not every neighbor wants that car. And you'd be surprised the number of complaints you get from people that say, how come I'm paying to have a car parked in front of this address 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Because if an officer works midnights, it doesn't appear that that car ever moves. <laughs> and so people complain about that, number one. Number two, there's a significant cost. That patrol car runs about $40,000 by the time you buy the car and you put all the equipment in it and you pay for it. And then people complain because we're letting them use our public funds to drive their car back and forth to work when, raise your hand if you have a company car. No one else does. And so, and when you start somebody at $60,000 a year to be employed by the government, people expect you to do more for less. It's a great idea. Um, the other thing is about having your home in your neighborhood. Most police officers, most, and I would, I would be shocked if it wasn't more than you know, they hide their addresses out of fear of retribution. Um, they, we, we spend time to go to the clerk and recorder, to go to the assessor's office, so that our addresses are not available on databases. I uh, actually tried, uh, I did some research a couple of years ago about uh, what cops work in, in what parts of town that they, um, that they live in, and it just depends on where. And then I try to do some incentives saying, hey, if you want to, uh, if you live in the creek and you work in the creek, uh, I want to give you dibs on good days off and all that stuff. Sand Creek, not the not, not the, the real creek. creek. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, the southeast part of town, and it didn't uh, it didn't uh, work so good. Um, the take home uh, issue is kind of interesting. Um, that the house the house thing is really intriguing, but the take home part is interesting. And like Bill, I would suspect that some of my guys and gals would take cars home if I gave them to them. Uh, most would. I'd love to know how that would be working in let's say Tulsa or Charlotte right now. Uh, having a police car in front of their house with their kids playing in the yard and all that. It's it's tough right now. Well, and the other issue that, that has come up recently is the IRS wants their piece of the pie. You give someone a benefit that has a tangible cost, they want that to be taxed. And so if you give them a car that they drive back and forth, they want you to claim that at X number of dollars per mile. And that's all right. That's all right. Sorry. Sorry, Dave. Got you covered. Some, was there questions? Uh, was your question over here? Sir, so I, I was wondering the difference of training in the county and the city because it seems like the city has more problems with the civilian shooting with the cops, you know. Is there a difference between? Same, same exact shooting? training. Same training. Um, in fact, a lot of times um, our instructors teach at, at times together, but it's the same uh, peace officer standards and training uh, requirements. Um, I'm seeing more of it with the city. I think more, it's just the contact. More, more city shootings? More con yeah, like when it comes to civilians, like, you know, with the cops or officers, <clears throat> you don't see as much with sheriffs as you do. I, I think what you see, sir, too, is sometimes a little bit of the, uh, the volume. Yeah. I think that there's uh, yeah. there's more people living in the city, yeah. you know, whatever you think the estimate is. 450 now? Yeah, 450. Uh, twice the number of people in the city as there are in the outside the city. Yeah, so it, it, there's more people in together. Uh, I would tell you on an average year, and gosh, knock on wood, um, uh, officer involved shootings are, are pretty rare here. Um, and uh, we probably had three this year. Uh, and, and we average, knock on wood again, about uh, five five year officer involved shootings. So you all still have tasers? To yes, sir. Mace? Yep. Okay, they still use them. Absolutely. <laughs> so is this like, like before you pull the your gun, what is like, you, you know, what is the first step before they get aggressive? Is okay, well, I, uh, and again, what we have is an escalation of force, and I will tell you it's always a bad idea to bring a taser to a gunfight. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and, uh, that rarely works out well. Um, but uh, we, uh, we train, uh, what Bill mentioned was uh, post police officer standards and training. 
we have manual requirements to train our officers in certain things. In this particular year, it was about um, there's extra training on bias-based policing, de-escalation techniques, okay. how you get people calmed down a little bit before you go right to weapons and things like that. I'm very, um, I'm very proud of the, how both the sheriff's office and the city uh, uh, does everything they can to calm things down before it goes to a shooting situation. Um, and I think we do a really good job with that, kind of calming things down and de-escalating it. I got 700 cops, and some are better than others at doing that, um, and, and keep the things from getting revved up. But um, it, when you look at the uh, number of calls for service that combined, we uh, we take care of with our deputies and our police officers. Very rarely do we use force. I mean, it's it's a very very small. I believe at the city uh, level, it's less than one or two percent of the time that we use any force at all. In other words, grabbing the person or anything like that. But the amount of times when we have to use a gun. Rare. Well, we have 531, so between the two of us, we've got about 1,100 cops. Um, think about that, 1,200 cops. Think about the number of contacts that, that law enforcement makes in this community every single day, every day of the year, 24 hours a day, and we have five to six shootings a year involving law enforcement. Hundreds of thousands of calls for service or contacts every single year. And that has a lot to do with the training that we provide. So while, while there is a concern that there may be a higher concentration in the city when there's a higher concentration of the population, the number, the sheer numbers of contacts that we have with the citizenry day in and day out from, that run the gamut from uh, homeless to um, burglaries, robberies, and progress. Um, it is a testament to the training and the and the commitment to the to the men and women that do this job that we have five shootings on average a year. The sheriff has a new strategy. What he does is he he chases people around the county into the city. Into the city. <laughs> that seems to be very effective for him and working really well. The downside is is we end up having to investigate those, and we just spend a lot of time on overtime. I'm going to just say we'll have time for one more question, and I'd like to make a quick comment and make a question, yes. and, and we'll, then we'll break. And have some informal time. Yes. I love that you're talking about education, and I understand that George Reed, the dean of the School of Public Affairs, is working on some additional police training where you wouldn't have to send officers away and yes. train here in the city. Do you feel like that's going to be an asset to both of your? You know, it's funny too. Training? When you go through budget issues and hard times, um, uh, staffing wise and budget wise, almost one of the first things that um, you have to look at critically. Is, uh, is the training of our officers, but you know the actual the reality of it is now more than ever we need to make sure our, our officers are efficient and on their uh, A game as far as the training and tools they get. So uh, it's a big deal to be uh, working with UCCS and Dr. Reed at uh, uh, School of Public Affairs about having maybe even a command college concept here where our bosses and our leadership of the uh, of the uh, departments we run um, are up to speed on the most recent things like that. But it's a um, it's a great uh, potential opportunity here for that. So it's a big deal. And again, we um, uh, we take advantage of any kind of training like that that we can. So uh, I'm all, all in on that. So we just uh, I had my whole staff attend uh, just last week at UCCS, kind of time management, project management, and all those things, trying to trying to figure out how to do it better. But um, I think it's a great opportunity. Historically, what I have to do is uh, send my staff officers to a command college either in Boston or, or Quantico, Virginia, and it's really, really expensive. When I have that uh, facility right here, that resource right here, we can send 10 or 15 you know, people at a time and uh, for the cost of sending one or two out of state, so very excited about that. Okay. And we're trying to leverage as much training as we can into a regional effort. We're trying to combine as much training as we do um, together. That's why we've been working on a regional range and driving track. Now. And, uh, and ethics training, the things that really are uh, things that both agencies can benefit. Because like you said, if, you're, if we send one person off to attend a school, we can spend five or six thousand dollars on one person to attend the school. If we spend five or six thousand dollars, we can bring the school to, to the house and we can put 40 or 50 people through the exact same training and get much more bang for our buck. So we're trying to combine that. That's why, you know, when uh, when Dr. Reed took over up there at UCCS, we started having discussions about this command college idea right away. We've already got legislators on board. Uh, my chief of staff is working with uh, a couple of new legislators that are going to start putting together a way to fund this college because there's nothing in this part of the country, anything between San Jose 
and uh, Northwestern University, there's nothing in this part of the country for a command college. And we know that we can bring it here, we can fund it better, and we can train our leadership better if we can host it. I'm going to make one comment and then ask you if you each like to sum up a bit. But, uh, when I was uh, helping with uh, United Way's Quality of Life Indicators project, and this is about three years old now, uh, we looked at public safety and we found a couple things that I think put some of this in context. One is that we have one of the lowest rates of violent crime in the country. Is that still true? Mm -hmm. and, and the other is that we have one of the highest rates of solved crimes in the country. And that's still true as well. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, based on staffing some resources, those lines are coming together uh, pretty quickly as far as uh, national uh, clearance rates and things like that. When I have to stand down certain um, proactive units uh, like our gang unit and our impact team, uh, that's proactive policing. And um, unfortunately it puts me more in a reactive uh, posture trying to reduce the call times and just getting cost to call for service. So if we lose some of that, uh, our numbers are getting closer and closer to national averages. They're still well above them, but uh, that's a trend that I'd like to uh, see uh, continue to go up. Me too. Absolutely. Sheriff, you want to say any last words? You know, I, I think that uh, to echo on that, we we work really hard at trying to do the right thing, trying to protect our community. We work really hard at building relationships. It takes a lot of time and commitment, not just on our part, but on the parts of our staff, <coughs> to uh, meet with as many community organizations, faith-based groups, et cetera, that we can to build those relationships, to build that trust, to hear the impact, to hear what it is our community wants us to do, and to respond accordingly. Pete? Yeah, uh, like, like Bill, you said, one of the biggest mistakes I can make as a police boss is to not um, not ask the community what they need in public safety. So it, it's a big deal to me. Support when I hear uh, new ideas and, and things that are going on in other places, uh, like you mentioned, Albuquerque or uh, kind of figuring out how to get our cops more uh, neighborhood, um, uh, more connected with their neighborhood. That's good stuff for me, and I, I take it seriously. And we go back and uh, and I ask my folks, hey, why why aren't we doing this, or what can we do better? So um, again, like I started this thing out, I appreciate your time coming in early and asking questions and uh, showing what's important to you. So I appreciate that support to me. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much.